Funding for lawmakers comes from the University of West Georgia in Carrollton, ensuring a better life for Georgians in the 21st century. More than 100 programs of study prepare students for successful careers in the critical professions of education and nursing, as well as business and the liberal arts. The Georgia Chamber of Commerce, the voice of Georgia's business community, over 4,000 members strong, working with lawmakers for over 90 years to make sure that our state remains a place where companies thrive. And by supporters of Georgia Public Broadcasting. Thank you. Coming up on Lawmakers, Chief Justice Leah Ward Sears delivers her fourth and final State of the Judiciary Address, a bill that would rein in some illegal aspects of selling life insurance policies to investors, and a look at legislation that would remove the statute of limitations on crimes committed against children. Those stories and more are coming up next. Live from Atlanta, this is Lawmakers. Here are your anchors, and Wandy Lawson and David Zelski. Hello, everyone. Also on tonight's broadcast, a bill on career academy initiatives is heard in the Joint House-Senate Education Committee. And it's the annual Home Education Day at the Capitol, but first our top story tonight, Chief Justice Leah Ward-Sears says goodbye to her colleagues in her final State of the Judiciary Address. Georgia's first female Supreme Court justice will leave the court on June 30th, and her final state of the judiciary address reflected back on her own legacy. You know, it's never easy to say goodbye. So began the longest part of Justice Sears' speech, the farewell. Although the address touched briefly on the impact of the failing economy on the court system, in contrast to previous years, there was no call for judicial salary increases. What I'm trying to say is this, our judges deserve a little justice too. So I just ask you to remember them when the judicial pay raise bill comes before you this year. I suppose my failure as Chief Justice was my inability to get my state's judges a much needed raise, a raise they have not had in more than a decade. If Sears leaves the bench wishing judges were better compensated, she says she's proud of her efforts to lower crime and poverty through the Supreme Court Commission on Children, Marriage and the Family and the Family Court Pilot Project. I think it is also important, in fact it is critical, for us to begin to deal with the legal crisis that has been created by the disintegration of the family. We must restore the importance of marriage and family as the foundation of our society. I hope all of you will continue to join in the efforts to keep marriages alive and strong and valued as an institution for the sake of our children and for the sake of our nation. And I assure you that whatever it is I do next, you have not heard the last from me on this issue. And following the Chief Justice's remarks, lawmakers Valerie Edwards talked to legislators about their reactions to Sears' fourth and final State of the Judiciary Address. And Valerie, would it be fair to describe the mood as upbeat today? In Wandi, it was a celebration indeed as Chief Justice Leah Ward Sears entered the House chambers earlier today to a rousing standing ovation from lawmakers. And as you can see, it was standing room only as the Chief Justice bid farewell to Governor Sonny Perdue, to her colleagues on the bench, to jurors throughout the state, and to lawmakers. In her address, Chief Justice Sears recalled the day she first learned she would be appointed to the state's highest court. And I'll never forget around Valentine's Day 1992, when Governor Zell Miller called and said to me, Judge, I want to let you know that I'm going to appoint you to the Supreme Court of Georgia. I was absolutely flabbergasted. I was only 36 years old, the youngest person ever to be appointed to the Supreme Court. I was a woman. No woman had ever served on the Supreme Court. And I was an African-American, the second 
behind my friend and brother, Justice Benham. But somehow I managed to regain my composure to thank Governor Miller, and I pledged to him that day in that phone call that I would never let him down, and I always tried to live up to that promise. Following the Chief Justice's address, lawmakers on both sides of the aisle had nothing but praise for her body of work. I thought she really spoke from her heart. A uh, very dedicated lady. Uh, she has uh, been, a, I think, a, a wonderful public servant over the years, as she described her duties as a judge. And uh, the remarks she made, I heard several representatives uh, speak very uh, complimentary, one saying it's one of the better speeches he's heard in his 12 years in the House. Well, we're very proud of her service as a judge and a justice in our courts. Uh, she has made our state very proud, and she has announced her retirement effective in the middle of this year. And so we do wish her well. She has certainly done a wonderful job and has been an inspiration to many Georgians. And I've been very proud to call her a friend and to work closely with her, and we will certainly miss her when she's gone. I did have an opportunity to speak with the Chief Justice and asked her of the legacy she leaves behind. Well, I've just had an extraordinary opportunity uh, to perform public service at this level, and I, can, I will continue to perform public service at, at another level, but I will be performing public service because I think I've dedicated my life years ago to, to serving people, so I'll, I'll be around. The Chief Justice officially steps down from the Georgia Supreme Court on June 30th of this year. In her private life, she says she will continue work begun earlier in her career on behalf of the state's families and children. Reporting live, I'm Valerie Edwards for Lawmakers. Okay, thanks for that report, Valerie. Well, a bill, a bill dealing with an insurance transfer process known as Stranger Originated Life Insurance, or STOLI, passed the Senate today. Senate Bill 61 aims to rein in some illegal aspects of selling insurance policies to business investors. This group of businessmen would come in and say, say you have a million dollar policy and it only had $100,000 worth of cash value. They would say, if you'll transfer the policy to us, we will continue to make the premium payments, and when you die, we'll get the million dollars, but we'll give you $300,000 right now for your policy. You, you can get the cash. This is a legitimate business transaction, but as always happens, it got delegitimized, and uh, is, that a, is that a word, Your Honor? <laughs> it, it became illegal when you started having people that had no insurable interest uh, getting a life insurance policy instituted that was intended to be transferred to uh, a business investment group. And this is, by definition, what they call stranger originated life insurance, STOLI. The definition of STOLI is on page 10, line 323, and that's the key to this whole, this whole piece of legislation is to enact that STOLI definition. Now, this is a compromise from the life insurance industry. It's also a compromise by the life settlement industry, and uh, everybody wants this regulated because they realize that this is bad for the industry. And Senator Hudgens added that if these STOLI measures are not clarified, then everyone's insurance policies will no doubt go up in the future. SB 61 passed unanimously and now goes over to the House. Child advocates are very pleased about the potential passage of a bill that would remove the statute of limitations on crimes committed against children. Representative Ben Harbin's House Bill 163 would give victims more time to report crimes. Lawmakers Tiana Fernandez has that story. What we've had are cases or, or instances where people have come forward and said, we've proven that this person was there and they committed this crime against the child, but the statute of limitations has gone by, and so that person is allowed to be free. Representative Harbin is working to remove the statute of limitations from violent crimes or sexual offenses against children. Currently, the law states that from the time a child turns 16, there is a seven-year time period for the victim to report the crime. After this time period, the case is closed. Harbin says he wants to mirror a Mississippi law so that there is no time limit attached to these types of crimes. 
If you commit crimes against children, you shouldn't have an opportunity to get free just because time has passed. So far, Representative Harbin faces no opposition regarding this bill. He believes he will receive the same support when it is brought to the House Non-Civil Judiciary Committee and hopes that his constituents continue to bring issues like this to his attention. I hope that all those who, who watch this and who do support this measure will call the representatives and encourage them to support it as well because I think the long run, what it does is sends a strong message to child molesters in this state. If you commit that crime, you're never going to get away with it because if we can ever catch you, we're putting you in jail. Reporting for Lawmakers, I'm Tiana Fernandez. Representative Harmon has made it clear that his main concern is protecting children. Again, House Bill 163 is scheduled to move to the House Judiciary Non-Civil Committee for review, and then Harbin is confident that it will pass. Budget issues also surfaced in the Senate today. Senator Gail Buckner took the well to discuss the importance of Georgia's outdoor therapeutic programs for youth who often struggle with disciplinary issues in the school system. Governor Purdue strikes this program in his budget. Senator Buckner explains. The young people that attend the outdoor therapeutic programs are the kids whose needs typically cannot be met in a traditional classroom. These are the kids when the mother drops them off at the front door of the school, they go through the front door and out the back and skip school that day. They're the kids that are in juvenile court. They're the kids that when they are in school, they are disruptive to the class. We need to meet their needs. The kids that go through the outdoor therapeutic program progress on an average, two months academically forward for every one month that they are in the program. This is one of those cuts that would be very unwise. Senator Vincent Ford also took a point of personal privilege today to discuss the subprime predatory lending issue. He says there are a couple of bills that have been filed, one actually in committee today, that aim to tackle this issue. These are the same people who are out in the lobby, them and their representatives out in the lobby, telling you not to do anything. Or if you do anything, be cautious, be tepid, be reserved. Well, let me tell you something. This is not the time for caution. This is not the time for tepid measures that do nothing to get at the real problem. There are people who are gonna tell you, listen to the banking industry because they know best. They know best how to deal with this problem. As I said earlier this week, these are the same guys that got us in this mess. And if we listen to them, if we tell them, we will sign on to your bad bill, your bad industry bill, then we are as much at fault as they are. Now, this was, in fact, the second time this week Senator Fort took the well to discuss this. Senate Democratic Leader Robert Brown has also been vocal this week on the same issue. Now, we bring you extended coverage of today's State of the Judiciary Address. Justice Sears reflected back on the late 80s when she was first elected to the Fulton County Superior Court. There were only four African-American Superior Court judges in the entire state and only six women. I can still remember my very first day on the bench down in Fulton County. I was trying a simple zoning case when I noticed that the room was packed. Standing room only, deputies, court reporters, administrative assistants, and other spectators were, were lining the walls and peering through the windows. They were there to watch me try my very first case, as if I were an alien who had landed in Fulton County. <laughs> Permit me to tell you a few of the things that I have learned in the last 26 years. I have learned that people are far more complex than the labels we sometimes affix to them. As judges, we would not be doing our jobs if we paid attention to labels because we have but one purpose, to know and uphold the laws of the state of Georgia and the United States, regardless of where the chips may fall. That means that in our work, we can espouse no ideology, no partisan political views, and we must ignore the false assumptions that people often make. I have learned that the people of Georgia are fortunate to have attorneys of the highest caliber and highest quality. 
I am always amazed at the ability of George's lawyers to present vigorous, well-reasoned arguments on both sides of extremely complicated issues and to answer the probing questions of the justices of our court. I have to commend the State Bar of Georgia for all that it does and is doing to maintain the exceptional quality of Georgia's lawyers. I have learned that whether you are a member of the legislative, executive, or judicial branches, we are really all just servants of the people, and we are all in this together. That means that we must communicate and cooperate with one another to accomplish the people's business. And we can do that in a way that preserves the integrity of all branches and honors the concept of the separation of powers. I have also learned in my 26 years as a judge that sometimes a whisper is better than a roar. I now know that to get your point across, you don't always need to carry a big stick. I've also learned that while you should never shy away from standing up and speaking out for that which you think is right, you really do need to pick your battles. And on a court like ours, the only way to succeed is with your intellect and your integrity. The best judges listen more than they talk, and they are patient. And that often means that when your position doesn't prevail, and it often does not, you have to let it go and move on. And I've learned that the most rewarding part of my career really has not been the offices that I have held, but the people I have met and with whom I've had the privilege of working. Since I've been Chief Justice, I have only been treated with generosity and kindness. The fact is that I have had the exceptional privilege of working with exceptional people who have dedicated years of hard and at times heartbreaking work to make Georgia's judicial system the very best in the nation. I am proud that when I step down, I will leave behind, according to a recent national study, the number one most productive Supreme Court in this country. That same study now ranks Georgia's high court as one of the five best state Supreme Courts in the nation based not only on productivity, but also now on national influence and judicial independence. And I am also pleased to say that the Georgia Court of Appeals is, is and is now ranked among the top five appellate courts in the number of opinions per judge that they they handle, which they handle and do a wonderful job. I am also proud that Georgia has a state trial system that works hard to ensure that all people have access to justice, no matter their status in life. Today, thanks to your support, Georgia is taking the lead with drug courts and mental health courts. This past year, both the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges cited the work of Georgia's drug courts as a model for our nation. Now, in the past, some called these so-called accountability courts uh, looked down on them, worried that they coddled criminals. But attitudes have changed because we now know that to prevent crime and to save taxpayer do dollars, we must break the cycles of drug addiction and mental illness that have contributed to the clogging of our courts and our jails. I am also proud, as I've said for the past two or three years, of the work of the Georgia Supreme Court Commission on Children, Marriage, and Family Law. As you know, I have long been a proponent that children do better with parents together. This is not just another do-good campaign unrelated to crime or justice. As a judge, I have seen daily the effects on our courts, not to mention our society, of family dissolution and dysfunction. There is so much sociological data now that suggests that children who grow up in healthy, 
intact families are less likely to engage in criminal behavior, are more likely to have productive lives that would never lead them to the inside of a court of law. That's why marriage continues to be the most pro-child institution and anti-poverty program we have. I came to the Supreme Court quite young. I determined some time ago to leave before I was too old. It has been a privilege to serve here. But the court, like most institutions, needs constant replenishment with people who are not comfortable with its ways. So it is time for me to move on. As to my future, my so-called retirement at 53 years old, to me, it's not an end for me. It is a beginning, a rebirth, a launching of a new adventure. I do not know yet exactly what I will be doing, but like you, I am a public servant at heart. My life has been driven by a desire to do what I can to make things better for people. And as long as God best blesses me with health and well-being, I will continue to serve in some capacity for that goal. Just as I pledged to Governor Zell Miller 17 years ago, I pledge to you today, whatever I do next, I swear to you, I will not let you down. Finally, I want to thank the people of Georgia for giving me this extraordinary opportunity. I want to thank the millions I've never met personally who are simply good, solid, hardworking people. Those who voted for me, called me with their words of support, sent me letters and notes along my journey. They were the ones who decided not once, not twice, but three times that I was worth keeping around by electing me to office in Georgia. So I am very proud of this state. I am proud to be a Georgian, and I am proud of all of you. God bless you, God comfort you, God bless Georgia, and God bless America. Thank you. Thank you very much. In other news, two tort reform measures from Governor Purdue were dropped today. Senate Bill 101 bars any citizen from bringing a products liability claim against any pharmaceutical corporation with 200 or more employees or who are headquartered in Georgia. The goal of this bill is to entice more bio companies to relocate to Georgia. However, opponents of the bill, like the Georgia Trial Lawyers Association, say this bill basically creates a get-out-of-jail-free card for these corporations. Purdue's second tort reform bill, SB 108, seeks to enact a loser pay system when it comes to lawsuits. This measure aims to cut down on frivolous lawsuits, which he says are backing up the state's caseload. The Georgia Trial Lawyers Association also opposed this bill, saying SB 108 would allow, quote, intimidation and fear to rule our court of law. The Senate Commission on Regulated Industries and Utilities gave a due pass recommendation to the Nuclear Energy Financing Act late this afternoon. Senate Bill 31 would allow utility companies to charge customers to cover the cost of building nuclear power plants before those plants are built. Now, critics say that the costs have not been accurately calculated and they worry that the public cannot handle a rate hike during the current economic climate. Others in opposition say that this bill would tie the hands of the Public Service Commission, which usually makes utility rate decisions. We'll have highlights of the committee discussion tomorrow night on lawmakers. Representatives from several of Georgia's career academies spoke at a joint House Senate Education Committee meeting today to appeal to lawmakers for more grant money. To uh, clarify what we're doing and the goals that we have set, this whole thing came about in Hapeville. You all may have heard of Hapeville. I don't know if you've ever driven through downtown Hapeville, but if you go into the Atlanta airport, you've seen that sign that says Hapeville. And um, so we've learned a lot by working with these uh, students at this uh, charter middle school. One thing that I've learned is this. Not every student that's in high school needs to be prepared to go to a four-year liberal arts school to major in psychology or, or philosophy. Students at these schools learn in small communities which have themes reflecting the students' desired career paths. Students also have the option of obtaining college credit while they're still in high school. I'm also going to say something else that I'm noticing working with these students that I think is true in every 
uh, county throughout the state and probably in the U.S. But I'm finding that there are students there that live in families and in situations in which this whole thing of preparing for a career and, and thinking about the future does not exist. In other words, the school is having to step in and take in that role to really, really uh, embrace each and every child to help them. And now we'd like to invite you to check out GPB's online resources at gpb.org lawmakers. Find out the latest from GPB's radio news team and watch Lawmakers Online. All that and more is available at gpb.org lawmakers. We invite you to visit that site and vote in our legislative issue poll. We'll bring you the results of that poll later this week. Well, students, parents, and homeschool leaders brought a message of equal access to the Capitol as part of Home Education Day today. Lawmaker's Emily Banks has more. People looking for an example of success and equal treatment for homeschoolers have found one in Tim Tebow, the Florida Gators quarterback who led his team to a second bowl championship this year. Some leaders in Georgia's homeschooling community are asking legislators to create a Tim Tebow law which would allow homeschooled students to play sports at their local schools. Teen Pact President Tim Eccles told the crowd gathered at the Capitol to talk to their legislators about this issue. We need equality here. We need the homeschoolers to have access. Homeschooled students have also faced adversity when trying to jointly enroll at Georgia universities. Karen Smith of Homeschool Access to College said the group organized a letter writing campaign last fall and received some promising news today at the Capitol. One of our organizations who's represented here today at Home Education Day at the Capitol got a copy of a letter that had been received by a homeschool parent saying that the policy had been revised. And it says that effective in the fall of 2009, uh, university system institutions are permitted to enroll homeschool students who meet the system requirements. But despite any so-called challenges homeschoolers faced, students and parents sang the praises of homeschool. We've been just amazed. We've been so pleased at the results. I'm 14 but I'm in 10th grade. Um, mostly all my classes are AP or honors. Reporting for Lawmakers, I'm Emily Banks. Coming up tomorrow on Lawmakers, more coverage of the Pass the Buck legislation, which would add a $1 tax to every pack of cigarettes sold in Georgia. HB 39 is currently in the House Ways and Means Committee. We'll have that story and all the latest Capitol news tomorrow night on Lawmakers at 7. If you've missed any part of this Lawmakers broadcast, be sure to tune in tomorrow morning when Lawmakers repeats at 5.30 a.m. on GPB or 7 a.m. on GPB Knowledge. You can also keep up with all the action under the Gold Dome daily on your local GPB radio station during Morning Edition, All Things Considered, and Georgia Gazette. Coming up right now on GPB Television, Georgia Traveler. Tonight's episode features the old Dixie Highway. That's coming up next here on GPB. And that is our broadcast for this, the 13th legislative day of the 2009 session of the Georgia General Assembly. I'm David Zelsky. And I'm in Wandy Lawson. Please join us tomorrow at 7 p.m. for Lawmakers. Good night. of Georgia Public Broadcasting.